Hello friends, we'd like to welcome you to Landmarks of Prophecy, those here locally in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thank you again for coming out and joining us tonight. Uh, those joining us across the country and around the world on the various uh, TV channels and also on the internet, a very special welcome to you. Now we have a very important presentation tonight, a very important Bible study. So I hope you all have your lessons in hand. The topic for tonight is called Born in a River. And those who are watching, if you don't have a lesson and you'd like to follow along with us, you can go to the Landmarks of Prophecy website. You can download tonight's lesson and follow along. Now, we have a very special weekend coming up. We have tonight's program, and then the next program is going to be tomorrow morning. It's going to be 11 o'clock here, local time in Albuquerque. So that's 11 o'clock mountain time for the folks who will be joining us. And the program tomorrow, the topic tomorrow that we're going to be studying is called Bowing to the Beast. We're getting right into the very heart of our study in the book of Revelation. So please plan to come out and join us. It's not too late to bring a friend. So tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock um, Mountain Time, is called Bowing to the Beast. That's our study. And then the next presentation will be tomorrow evening. And it's a part two of the morning presentation. It's the Mark of the Beast called Mark for Death. So please come out. Very important subjects that we need to study together. What does the Bible have to say about the beast power? What is the mark of the beast? These are some of the things that we'll be covering tomorrow. So a very important day. Have you enjoyed singing along our theme song for our program? Have you found yourself walking around at home just humming the tune and maybe repeating the words? So at this time, I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to be singing that together. Pastor Doug will come out and Chuck and lead us in our theme song for today. Hello everyone, we're going to sing. A lamp for our feet and a light for our way. The Bible has all that we need to point us to Jesus and teach us to pray. A storehouse of heavenly seed. For ages found power in these pages, reversing the cursing of sin, a rock of foundation for all his creation, exalting the Savior of men, exalting the Savior of men. With landmarks of prophecy, visions, and dreams, pointing his pilgrims ahead. Sweet manna from heaven, refreshing the soul, the Bible is our living bread. For ages the sages found power in these pages, reversing the cursing of sin, a rock of foundation for all his creation, exalting the Savior of man, exalting the Savior of man. All right, tonight we're going to teach you a new verse. It'll be on the screen, so you mumble through the first time, and we'll lead you. All right, here, you ready? With proverbs and promises, parables true, the words of his book make us wise. A double-edged sword in the hand of the Lord, unmasking the Father of lies. For ages the sages found power in these pages, Reversing the cursing of sin, a rock of foundation for all his creation, exalting the Savior of men, exalting the Savior of men. Amen. Why don't you remain standing? We'll have Brother Chuck offer our opening prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are very thankful this weekend to come together to hear your word. We pray in a special way that your Holy Spirit will be with us tonight. Mm -hmm. 
You'll give us clarity of thought. You'll open up our hearts and minds as we open your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, before you sit down, turn to the person to the right and to the left and just smile real big, shake their hand, tell them good evening. We're going to invite Dr. David DeRose to come back again, and he has an important health nugget. You may be seated. If it had been a year ago, no one would have thought anything about it. But because it's 2014, when Matilda arrived at Roberts International Airport in Liberia, she was carefully screened. That 90-year-old woman was asked a series of questions. No, she knew no one with Ebola. No, she felt fine. No evidence of a fever. And so Matilda was allowed to board that plane to Lagos, Nigeria. And then on from Lagos to London's Heathrow Airport. Again, the questions every time. No, no, no. And the temperature, 98.4. She finally landed at JFK International Airport there in New York. And when she went through the questions there, well, I mean, she'd been traveling for over 24 hours, and she ate some strange food on the plane. She was feeling a little bit queasy, but didn't mention anything about it. They checked her temperature. It was 98.2. And so she was allowed to board the plane to Los Angeles International Airport. On that ride across this great nation of ours, the plane ran into quite a bit of turbulence. Matilda started to uh, feel a bit more agitated in her stomach. She, she didn't quite know what you're supposed to do on a plane. You know, at 90 years old, she obviously hadn't flown much. And so instead of looking for those ubiquitous bags, she started to get up out of her window seat, trying to make her way to the bathroom. She was oblivious to the cries of the flight attendant. You know, mind that fastened seatbelt sign. But as she was trying to get out, suddenly it happened. I won't go into details, but a number of the passengers were contaminated with Matilda's bodily fluids. If you were on that plane, sitting somewhere in front of where all the action took place, by the time you landed at LAX, there'd be no questions when the space-suited public health officials boarded the plane. The worst news, though, came the next morning when Matilda was diagnosed with Ebola infection. Not a true story. I first told it several weeks ago, and no doubt people thought I was fear-mongering in telling such a story. How could someone with no fever cross international lines and contaminate people with Ebola? Just a fictitious scenario? Yesterday, November 13th, the Wall Street Journal. Very similar story. It wasn't coming into the United States. It was a Muslim imam traveling from, guess where? That's right, one of the countries where Ebola was rampant. He crossed the border into Mali without anyone realizing that he had Ebola. He had no fever. You see, the evidence indicates that over 10% of those who've been afflicted with the current Ebola virus infection do not get a fever. It seems most likely to occur in people who are older. We've known this for years in the medical community. If your immune system is not up to par, you may not develop a fever even when you have an infectious illness. The point of these stories, whether it's a true one in the Wall Street Journal, where now Mali is dealing with 
the Ebola virus, or whether it's here in the United States. By the way, this same page of the Wall Street Journal, if you saw it, you may have noticed the title. This is page A7, November 13, the Ebola battle. That's the title for that entire page, the Ebola battle. And uh, on that very same page, President, referring to Obama, seeking $6.2 billion to battle deadly disease. Yes, it may seem that Ebola is off the front pages, but it is still a concern. Ebola is something we still need to be aware of, we still need to be cognizant of today. Is Ebola still a threat? Most definitely. Now, what bothers me about the language, and we saw it again in the Wall Street Journal, is the way Ebola is being spoken about, it's like some kind of rogue enemy army that is coming onto American soil. And the only ones who can save us are the U.S. military, the Centers for Disease Control, and the NIH. But I'd like to suggest to you there is actually good news in the midst of all this dialogue. And as I was thinking about tonight's meetings, I had to think that it is much like Bible prophecy. Now, this may sound like a strange comparison, but I've noticed over the years that you may have invited some of your friends. You said, we're hearing some wonderful meetings on Bible prophecy, and they say, no, that's scary. I'm not going. I see the same thing as a physician. Some of the things that scare us, God wants us to be aware of because he wants to take the fear away. He's trying to comfort us. Let me give you some comfort in the midst of ongoing concerns about the Ebola virus. And it has to do with something that someone is not talking about. In fact, I don't hear anyone talking about it. It's something called inapparent infections. Inapparent infections. Are you aware that many people who are infected with a host of viruses, whether it might be polio in the days before the vaccine, or influenza, the flu, or mono, mononucleosis, the kissing disease. All of these diseases often cause inapparent infections. What does that mean? That means many people who are infected with the virus never get clinically ill. They never get sick, apparently. Maybe you've heard of Eastern equine encephalitis. Maybe we should be more scared of it. Well, you say, well, we don't have it here in the Western states. That's true. But if you were out east, Eastern equine encephalitis is a devastating disease. It actually causes a brain infection. If you get Eastern equine encephalitis, the odds are greater that you will die from it than if you were to get Ebola here in the U.S., based on our current experience. 33% of people who come down with clinical Eastern equine encephalitis infection die from it. Those who survive often have permanent brain infirmity. So why aren't we talking about Eastern equine encephalitis? The reason is most people who are afflicted with it have an inapparent infection. What about Ebola? Everyone's afraid of it. But the good news about Ebola is that many people who are infected with the Ebola virus never get sick at all. This is data from Gabon, Africa. Back in 1996, an outbreak of the same Ebola species or subtype that's afflicting the world right now, Ebola Zaire. Researchers there in the context of this terrible outbreak, nowhere near the scope of what was happening in this uh, current outbreak. But they identified 24 individuals who had had close contact with patients with Ebola. All of these individuals, even though I called them patients, they were often family contacts, had been exposed to infected matter, whether it was feces or blood or vomit. None of the 24 got ill. But amazingly, when they checked their blood for evidence of infection, 11 of them had been infected with the virus, but never got sick. The good news about Ebola infection is that even if Ebola again comes onto American soil, even if it comes knocking on the doors of Albuquerque, you can be exposed to it and not get sick. What I'm going to point out to you in future presentations this weekend, we are actually going to show you that you can decrease your risk of Ebola infection, influenza, the common cold, and other illnesses by simply heeding some powerful Bible principles 
that will enhance your immune system. Are you looking forward to that? I am. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God will show us. It may be scary, but He's wanting to give us hope. Well, I know some of you sometimes want hope when it comes to the questions that you're dealing with in life, especially those Bible questions. The good news is Pastor Jean Ross is back this evening, and he and Pastor Doug are going to answer those questions right now. Amen. Thank you very much, Dr. DeRose. Good evening, friends. You know, just before... Hello, Pastor Ross. How are you doing? Hello, Pastor Doug. Good. Thank you. We never get to visit except right now, didn't we? <laughs> We've been getting questions from all over the world. We just, uh, our office emailed us this week. People are watching. Well, first of all, we got some churches we'd like to welcome. Uh, first one, I actually have a correction. One night I said it was Allentown, Pennsylvania. It was actually Annapolis, Maryland. They're going to say hi again since I said their church wrong. We've got another church that is tuning in in uh, North Glen, Colorado, and um, we want to welcome them. We got a group that sent us a picture that are watching and doing the seminar in uh, Brookings, Oregon. I know where that is. I landed there once by accident. <laughs> then you've got Columbia, South Carolina, uh, another group. We can wave at them, yeah. Lincoln City, Oregon. These are just a few that have sent us in pictures. There are actually thousands around the world. We've had Bible questions come in from Australia, Chile, Croatia, Curaçao, Finland, Germany, India, Jamaica, Malawi, Malaysia, Netherlands, Philippines, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, St. Lucia, West Indies, South Africa, where Pastor Ross is from, <laughs> Tonga, did you send in the one from South Africa? No. Tonga, Trinidad, West Indies, England, Wales, Italy, Canada, France, and others. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. So we've got friends all over the world that are gathered with us studying. All right, questions for tonight. All right. Well, our first question is this. Can people that are saved still be lost? You know, some very sincere Christians believe that once you are saved, you cannot be lost. But sometimes people that at least profess to be saved start acting very lost. And then when you ask them about that, they'll say, well, they probably never were saved. Well, that sort of destroys the assurance that those who are saved can't be lost. But does the Bible teach that a person can be in a saved condition and be lost? Yes, there are several examples. Jesus said in John chapter 15, speaking of the branch abiding in the vine, if any branch does not abide in me, doesn't remain in me, it'll be cut off and burned. In Revelation 3 verse 5, Jesus said that if we do not repent, our candlestick, speaking to the churches, it's a letter to the churches, will be taken out of its place. King Saul in 1 Samuel, was filled with the Spirit. The Bible says God gave him a new heart and the Lord was with him. Later he became proud and stubborn. He grieved away the Holy Spirit and God would not speak to him. Uh, there, Peter talks about someone who was washed but like a pig they returned to wallowing in the mire. Um, so there's a number of examples in the Bible um, but that doesn't mean you can't have assurance of your salvation. Jesus said I'll never let go of you. If we don't let go of him he'll never let go of us. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And so we don't want you to be discouraged, but it's also reckless to think that once you're saved, you can do anything and you can't be lost. That would mean God would have to take away your freedom to choose. And you can't force a person to love you. The Lord is not taking anyone to heaven in handcuffs. You all need to be willing to serve Him. Amen? Amen. Ready for our next question. Doesn't Acts chapter 20 verse 7 teach that the disciples were meeting on Sunday? Let's read that together. Yeah, you know, we studied the Sabbath truth, and, and some folks are saying, well, why do so many Christians go to church on Sunday? There's a couple of examples they point to in the New Testament that speak of meetings that happened on the first day of the week. Of course, the Lord's Supper was on Thursday. I mean, wonderful things happened on many days of the week. But here's this verse in Acts 20, verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Now when does a day begin and end biblically? Sundown in the evening. So it tells us, verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper chamber where they were gathered and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus who sinking into a deep sleep, he was overcome with sleep, as Paul continued speaking, preachers preach too long, people fall asleep, 
As Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and fell on him, embraced him, and said, Don't trouble yourself. His life is in him. And he was raised. Luke is telling this story not to say there has been a new day established for the Christian Sabbath. He's just saying they met Saturday night. Seventh day ends at sundown. They had been together all Sabbath. Sun went down as the first day begins at night. See, when it's nighttime on the first day, that's Saturday night. You with me? So those who use this to try to say that this is the establishment or proof of New Testament Christians keeping Sabbath, it actually proves the opposite. Okay. Next question. Is there no night in heaven? Well, there is still a separation of day and night, but especially when it talks about the New Jerusalem, it says there's no need of the sun there because the Lord God illuminates the whole city. God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And, but it does tell us that from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come and worship before Him. And the Sabbath is separated by days. The earth is still going to spin. That was part of God's original plan. It simply is saying that it's never dark in the city. You remember I told you that even the light of the moon will be like the light of the sun now. The light of the sun, Isaiah says, will be seven times brighter. So the whole world will be brighter. Night there. You ever go to like a real high clear spot and you can see so many more stars when you're away from the city? The skies at night in heaven will be creamed with stars. And you'll be able to see so much farther, it'll be like looking through the Hubble with your own naked eyes. Won't that be something? All right, our next question is, how did the three wise men from the East hear about the prophecy of the Messiah? Google. <laughs> no, <laughs> no um, they probably were reading the prophecies of Balaam. Balaam was called a Magi. Now, those were the wise men. Balaam was a prophet from the East, and actually Balaam had prophesied uh, in the book of Numbers, a star will arise out of Jacob. And they had been reading that prophecy, and when they saw that star over Bethlehem, or over Israel at first, they knew that was a sign. All right, the next question is, in what language were the Ten Commandments originally written? I think it's the tables of stone. Right. Well, we're not sure, but we, I think it's a strong assumption it was written in the language of the people, which would have been... Uh, uh, I think it's a Paleo-Hebrew. Uh, in other words, the early form of Hebrew. It's probably how God wrote it so the people could read it. Okay, the next question that we have, will we keep our earthly names in heaven? Um, probably not. Just like God gave Jacob a new name when he wrestled with the Lord and he overcame, Jacob got the name. It went from deceiver to Israel, which means overcomer or prince with God. The Bible tells us in Revelation, it's in chapter 2 or 3, I don't remember. It says, I will give you a stone with a new name. Chapter 3. Chapter three. He's the Revelation expert. Uh, in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus promises to give us a stone with a new name in it. We will have a new name that's just between us and Jesus. The next question, maybe you want to deal with this one, take a little bit of time. Can you find all ten commandments in the New Testament? Well, you can find many of them word for word, like honor your father and mother, Paul says, which is the first commandment with promise. One commandment is not found specifically, but it is certainly implied. You know which one that is? It's not the Sabbath. Sabbath's in the New Testament. It's the third commandment. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, do we all agree that God still wants us to keep that commandment? Mm -hmm. It does say in the Lord's Prayer, Hallowed be thy name. So certainly, and let the name of God uh, be honored. And so certainly the New Testament teaches all ten commandments. Uh, they're not all worded in a group like Deuteronomy or Exodus. All right, our final question for the evening. Uh, who are the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3? Uh, some have believed that the two witnesses are Moses and Elijah that are going to come back to earth. But they're only really half right. Now, the reason I say that is uh, Moses and Elijah represent the Word of God, the Law and the Prophets. Moses represents the Law. Elijah represents the prophets. Moses and Elijah now have their glorified bodies. They're not going to come down to earth and die. When it talks about the two witnesses dying and their bodies lying in the street, it's talking about the Word of God. Oh, I wish we had time for that prophecy during this series. The Word of God that it was um, uh, just desecrated during the time of the birth of atheism in Europe for three and a half years. A day is a year in prophecy. 
Two witnesses are New and Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, the Word of God. You know, Pastor Doug, we got a book called Who Are the Two Witnesses? Yeah. And folks can read it online at the For Amazing free. Facts website. Yeah. yeah, there's an archive there. You can take a look at the book. Give you a lot more information about the two witnesses. Amen. Well, Pastor Doug, again, just to our friends who are watching around the country and around the world, you can send us your Bible questions by going to the Landmarks of Prophecy website and just click on the uh, tab that says contact us or submit a question. And we'll try and answer as many questions as we can from night to night. We have a very special guest who's joining us this evening. Christian Bodell is going to be singing for us once again, and we're grateful that he's here. Amen. Thank you so much, Christian. That's a beautiful song. Even though it's familiar, it's just always rich. We sure appreciate that. Welcome, friends, once again to our Landmarks of Prophecy presentation. And I hope you're going to enjoy the program tonight. You're going to have to wait a minute because I just walked out and left my clicker back there. So just, I'll be back. <laughs> I'm standing here, I just realized something's missing. <laughs> Let me start over. Welcome, friends, to the Landmark of Prophecy. No, that wasn't me. Let me try one more time. 
We're trying to make a good tape we can use. Welcome, friends. Now that was too phony. <laughs> We're just glad you're here. <laughs> Tonight's study is really a very important one. And in some ways, we're going to be departing a little bit from a purely prophetic theme, but it is something that the prophets talked about quite a bit. Uh, The lesson title tonight is Born in a River. And as we often do, we begin with a story from the Bible. Now, this story is based on something that happens in the second book of Kings. Some of you have heard about an individual by the name of Naaman. Naaman, the Bible tells us, was a mighty general. He was a courageous man. He was a man that had been used of the Lord. And everything sounds really good about Naaman until you get to the part where it says, but, last five words, but he was a leper. He had everything going for him. He was a successful man, had achieved a lot. He was wealthy, famous, brave, respected. But then he came down with the worst disease you could have in biblical times, no cure, nothing to arrest its growth, and it just represented being unclean and separated from the ones you love, a deadly contagious disease. And throughout the Bible, leprosy is compared to sin. And Naaman could no longer embrace his family. When he was going down the streets of Damascus, people would avoid him now. And it really caused a terrible stigma And what good is it if you're strong and you're brave and you're wealthy and you're famous and you're dying? What profit is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? But he was a leper. No matter what you might achieve in this life, you'll never have lasting happiness as long as you have the disease of sin because it is a deadly disease. It slowly eats away at your life. Well, while Naaman was waiting for the inevitable, the Bible tells us that he had a little maid, a young girl, that served in his family as a servant. She had been captured during one of the raids where the Syrians went down into the northern country of Israel and they used to raid the farms and they'd carry off people and sell them into slavery, kind of like Joseph was sold by his brothers. But this young girl, instead of being bitter, she figured, well, if God could use Joseph where he was, maybe God can use me here. And when she found out her master came down with this terrible terminal disease, she told her mistress, if my master Naaman was only with the prophet Elisha, he would heal him of his leprosy. Elisha was that great Old Testament prophet that had a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Matter of fact, everybody that ever came to Elisha in the Bible, he answered their prayers and worked a miracle for him. It's something like Jesus. Names even similar. Jesus' name is Yahshua. It means Jehovah is Savior. Elisha's name is Elohim is Savior. And so when you're dying, you're sort of desperate. And when this girl said with such confidence, oh, the prophet in Israel, he would heal you. He was ready to try anything. And so Naaman, he got permission from the king of Syria to go down to Israel. He took a king's ransom with him, millions of dollars by today's standards, to pay for his healing something like our medical bills today, right? And he comes to the prophet Elisha, but Elisha doesn't even come out to him. Elisha sends out Gehazi, his servant, who gives him the message, go, this is 2 Kings 5 verse 10, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. His leprosy had advanced so far that he may have even lost some of his digits says, not only will that return, but you'll also be cleansed from the disease. Well, when Naaman heard that, first of all, he was a little insulted. He first went to the king, and the king said, I can't help you. And he eventually went to Elisha, and Elisha didn't come out, but he sends a servant. And he's a general. He's used to dealing with people that have prominence and prestige. And and then what, what do you, how do you interpret it when someone says to you, you need to go wash? What's implied when someone says, you need to go bathe? If someone says, you need to go bathe seven times, what does that imply? (laughs) But there's more. Have you ever seen the Jordan River? It's almost never clear. It is quite literally the lowest river in the world. There's no river that runs lower than where the Jordan River runs into the Dead Sea. And it sort of catches all of the 
washings that come off the hills of Judea and it's usually kind of brown or green. And so when someone tells you to wash and they tell you to wash seven times and they tell you to wash seven times in a dirty river, any of you ever, years ago, when your kids took a bath and you've got several kids, they all kind of shared one bath? Any of you ever have to go last? That was me. I don't know why. They always said nobody wanted to go after me. But it implies then that you're dirty. And that offended Naaman. And it says that he turned and he went away in a rage. And he said within himself, Are not Abana and Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, cleaner than all the waters of Israel? I could have stayed home and washed in those rivers. And he, I thought he'd at least come out to me and wave his hand over the place and heal the leper. And so he's insulted. His pride was offended. And so he began to storm home with his entourage guarding all the treasure, his chariots. And, but on the way home, he realized he was going home to die. And God's good. He had to ride by the Jordan River to go home. And as he was going by the Jordan River, his servants came up to him and they said, uh, Master, if the prophet had told you to do something extraordinary, like go kill a hundred Philistines, you would have done it. But he just said, wash in the river. Why don't you do it? Finally, he humbled himself. He thought, what have I got to lose? I'm going home to die. And he stopped. He got off his horse and he went down to the edge of the river and he took off his armor. You see, the Lord had given several messages to Naaman. He gave a message through this little girl servant. He gave a message through the servant of Elisha. Now he gives a message through his own servants, his guards. And he thought his problem was leprosy. His problem was pride. That's most of our problem. That's where the devil fell. God was waiting for him to humble himself. And he finally took off his armor and all his medals and laid it at the river and he went down as he was. And he dipped himself there in the muddy waters of the Jordan. He came up. He still had leprosy. And he looked at his soldiers and said, This is a waste of time. How humiliating. And they said, Master, the prophet said seven times. Don't stop. You're almost there. So he dipped himself two times and three times. He came up. Leprosy was stinging now. It's as bad as ever. And he thought, what, this is, what am I? And they said, seven times. He goes down four times, five times, six times. And every time he went down, he thought it was washing away his leprosy. It was washing away his pride. Finally, after the seventh time, he went down. He came back, back up again. And the Bible says, his flesh was restored to him again and he was clean. Not only was he healed, do you think he was happy? The Bible says his flesh came back like the flesh of a little child. Isn't that something? A soldier, picture that, a big soldier general with baby skin. He got out of the water and his soldier said, Whoa, wonderful sir, can we feel your cheek? <laughs> it looks so new and vital. But that's what God does for us. He washes away our leprosy and we become like little children. A Christian is a soldier with baby skin. Now don't miss the very important point in here. Do numbers matter to God? Was he cleansed the third time or the fourth time when God said the seventh time? When God says, I've blessed the seventh day, do you think it matters to the Lord what day? God means what he says. He has a blessing for us when we obey and do what He says. Now the uh, message today, the Jordan River really was a type of a cleansing from sin. It's later where um, Jesus is baptized and John the Baptist begins his ministry. Now during the bulk of our prophecy studies together we're dealing with different Bible truths but all of those truths are of no value to you if you have not made a commitment to Jesus. And the presentation tonight, because this weekend we are getting into some of the strongest Bible subjects. You heard the announcement, we're going to be talking about who is the Antichrist, bowing to Babylon, the mark of the beast. These are some very heavy things, very serious truths. Most fearful curses you find in the Bible are in Revelation chapter 13 and 14 where it talks about those that receive the mark of the beast. And in order, in order for you to spiritually appreciate these things, I think it's important for you in your own mind to say, have I humbled myself? Am I surrendered to the Lord? Am I wanting to be washed? So our study is about how to receive that washing that God talks about and being a new creature. It's related to baptism. 
Naaman was really like your first Old Testament baptism. Question number one. What New Testament prophet washed people in the Jordan River? You can read the answer in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, 5, and 6. And the answer will be on your screen. You're, of course, welcome to say them with me. And you can fill them out in your lessons. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He was the forerunner who went before Christ to prepare the way. It says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all of Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan. By the thousands, people came swarming out of the cities to this remote spot down by the river to hear this primitive preacher out there in the wilds among the cathedrals of the canyons saying, Prepare the way of the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Messiah is coming. Speaking of the first coming. And to show that they were preparing for Jesus' first coming, they were to humble themselves, repent of their sins, and baptism was basically the, the commitment, the ceremony that really sealed the deal, that they said, I am seeking after God and making a decision to live a new life. So they, that was symbolic of that washing. Number two, what glorious Bible ceremony symbolizes the washing away of the leprosy of sin? You find the answer in Acts 22, verse 16. They said to Paul, Ananias said to Paul, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. So baptism is very clearly a symbol of what we do that recognizes our sins being washed away. Now typically when they were baptized they came down to the river. You didn't have to have a river but you did need to have enough water where a person was immersed. It represented a new birth. It represented a resurrection. It represented a marriage. It just meant a new beginning. And I don't know about you, but have you ever wished you could start over? I just remember prophecy. Isaiah the prophet, when he begins his prophecy, there's very few Old Testament prophets that uh, have more prophecy than Isaiah. You know how he begins in chapter 1? As he's getting ready to introduce some heavy prophecy, he says in Isaiah 1 verse 16, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. What does he mean by that? Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. That's what we're doing here. We're learning. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet. You ever feel that way? They can be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the, Lord, of the Lord has spoken it." So this was a message of even all of the apocalyptic prophets in the Bible. Humble yourself, surrender to the Lord, get a new beginning, be washed. And then he introduces these heavy prophecies. It's also that way in Revelation. Uh, it talks about how to be cleansed in the messages to the churches. Number three, according to the Bible, how many different kinds of baptism are acceptable? We're going to let the Bible give us the answers to this. Ephesians 4 verse 5, you can say it with me. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now not only is there one Lord and one truth we are baptized into, there is only one biblical method of baptism that you see as you read from cover to cover in the Bible. Matter of fact, the word baptize itself comes from the Greek word baptizo, and that means for something to be plunged, immersed, dipped in the ancient literature when they would dye cloth in the ancient Greek. Whenever they would dye, they said that you would baptizo the cloth in the dye. Otherwise, if you sprinkled, you'd get polka dots. They would plunge it. They would immerse it. It would soak into all the fibers. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to go through this ceremony of a total consecration to Him. And so the ceremony actually means something. Um, some things are sacred and they shouldn't be tampered with. Colossians 2 verse 12, you can read there, it says, We are buried with Him in baptism, wherein you are also risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised Him up from the dead. So one thing that baptism represents is a burial. 
the old man is crucified with Christ. He is dead and buried. Now when the person goes under the water, they at least momentarily hold their breath, which is symbolic of a death. And when they come up again, it's taking a breath. It represents a resurrection and a new beginning, a new life. If uh, you were told to go bury the garbage by your parents and you took it outside and sprinkled some dirt on it and then family wonders the next day why the raccoons spread it all over the yard and they say, well I sprinkled it. They say, no, we told you to bury it. And that's what we want done with our sins, right? We want them buried, out of sight, under the blood. Number five, how was Jesus, who is our example, baptized? Now, a Christian is what? A follower of Christ. Do you have any doubts about if it makes a difference how you're specifically baptized? How was Jesus baptized? You read in Mark chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, it says, Jesus then came to the Jordan River and was baptized of John in the Jordan and straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open. Uh, you, it's hard to miss the imagery here. First of all, John is baptizing at a river. If the biblical method of baptism was to pour, to sprinkle, and I, I don't get upset if some of you were sprinkled and you say, what are you telling me my baptism is not valid? Stay with me. But if that was the biblical method, then why did John need a river? He could have baptized with a canteen in Jerusalem, right? I mean, you, you don't need a river. You need a river. As a matter of fact, it tells us, you could read uh, the next verse that's in your lesson, John 3, 23. It's a note actually. Now John, the Baptist, was also baptizing in Enon near Selim because there was much water there. Why did he use that spot? Because there was much water there. And when you had those crowds of people and they were being immersed, you needed a place that was deep. And that's actually a photograph there of the Jordan River. Question number six. How did Philip baptize the treasure of Ethiopia? The Bible tells us that um, Philip, who started out as a deacon, later became an evangelist, was um, led by the Lord. The Holy Spirit told him, I want you to go down to the deserts by Gaza. And he wasn't sure why the Lord was leading him there, but when he went down there, there he saw the treasurer for the Queen Candace of Ethiopia was riding in his chariot. He was an Ethiopian. And he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah about the Messiah, a prophecy about the Messiah. He's parked. He's reading out loud. Philip overhears him reading the prophecy in Isaiah 53 saying, Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And it's the prophecy about Jesus. And Philip says, Do you know what you're reading? He said, I could sure use some help if a man was here to help me. He said, I can explain that to you. He said, why don't you ride with me in the chariot? It's the first example of a hitchhiker in the Bible. So he gets up in the chariot and he preaches about Jesus as the fulfillment of this very prophecy. The man's heart is stirred within him. He is a Jewish a believer in Yahweh who had come to Jerusalem to worship. He's on his way back to Ethiopia. He says, I don't want to go back without making this decision to be baptized and you're one of his disciples, you're qualified to do it, what prevents me from being baptized? Philip said, nothing, if you believe with all your heart. And so it tells us, Acts 8, 38 and 39, what happened? They found out there was some water there evidently. It says they went down into the water, both, if he's sprinkling, they wouldn't both need to be in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And then it says, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. That's the first example in the Bible of someone being beamed from one location to another. It's quite literally what happened. I mean, he came out of the water and the Ethiopian was just going to praise the Lord and poof, Philip disappeared. And then Philip finds himself off in Joppa walking down the road. God had something else for him to do in a hurry. Brought him all the way to the desert to baptize this one man. You know why? That man is a leader took the gospel down to Ethiopia. That man became a messenger to his whole country and so it was very important for him to reach him. So if you can see from these examples in the Bible, every example in the Bible of someone being baptized, they're all being immersed. Number seven, what other truths are symbolized by baptism? Romans chapter 6 verse 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, we touched on that part, but it goes on to say that as Christ was 
raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in what kind of life? A newness of life. You know, when you're baptized, it represents you're going to get a whole new beginning. Wouldn't you like to know there was something you could do and you could just peel away the past and experience a new birth? You could get a divine transfusion and just know that you've been forgiven for all the mistakes that you've ever made and that God can do it lovingly and He has a right to do it because Jesus has traded places with you and He's giving you His new life. And then because you appreciate what He's done for you, because He died to give you this new beginning, it says we walk in what kind of life? A newness of life. So a preparation to walk in a newness of life goes along with baptism. But you notice He said it's like not only a death and a burial, it's like a resurrection. Now some people say we're supposed to now keep Sunday as the Sabbath in honor of the resurrection. If you've heard that before, let me see your hands. A lot of people have heard that before. I asked earlier, and there's no scripture that tells us that, but there is a scripture that tells us there's something we're supposed to do to honor the resurrection. You know what it is? Baptism. Baptism is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. God didn't create a new Sabbath day because there was nothing wrong with the old one. Baptism is what is an indicator that we believe in the risen Lord and we come from the waters and are willing to live a new life. Romans uh, 6 verse 5 For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. And so baptism is a symbol of death, burial, resurrection, new life. It's like the old man is dead and buried and you become a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Bible also tells us that baptism is symbolized as a birth. You know, when a person briefly goes under the water, a baby before it's born is in an envelope of water, and then when it comes forth, the first thing you want to do is see it breathe. I know the old, uh, old model was the doctor would kind of pick them up by their feet and give them a stinging swat on the posterior, right? And then they'd let out a shriek and everybody was so happy because that meant that they were breathing. I forget which one it was. Bonnie remembers one of our boys. Karen was on oxygen. Stephen, before he was born, Karen was on oxygen and the baby was so well oxygenated when he came forth he had no desire to breathe. He was just pink and fine and didn't want to breathe. Took a while to get him to have that craving to breathe and we all felt a lot. We were breathing better when he started breathing. Right? And so when a person goes underwater and they come out it's like a birth. It's a new beginning. And we all need that new birth as well. Number eight. How important is baptism for a Christian? Mark 16.16. 16. Now this is, this is very important. You're wondering, Pastor Doug, why are you talking about this? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, you notice he doesn't say he that is not baptized will be damned. He says he that believeth not will be damned. But he that, does not, he that believes and is baptized. Wow! Who said that? Jesus. Is it important for us to make a priority out of what Jesus makes a priority out of? You know, chapter where you find John 3.16, you also find John 3.5. He's talking to Nicodemus, same conversation. Jesus said, except a man and a woman be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Wow! Pastor Doug, are you telling me that um, Nobody who has not been baptized is going to make it to heaven? No? Well, I'll explain. First of all, in this verse where Jesus said, unless he's born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You need both births. A person can be born in the water, and Jesus here is referring to water baptism. Some Christians think that what Jesus is saying here is, except a man is born naturally of a woman where he comes out of the envelope of water and of the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of heaven but the context of the Gospel of John is talking about baptism and it would really be redundant to say unless you're born of a woman and the Spirit you can't... Anyone here not born of a woman? Just wondering. You never know these days. <laughs> but the Bible says except you're born of the water it's talking about water baptism is something you choose and the Spirit something God chooses you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. 
give me, let me give you an example. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the children of Israel being saved from the slavery of Egypt is a symbol for salvation. After they sacrificed the lamb, God baptized the whole nation in the water when they went through the Red Sea and in the spirit with a pillar of fire. Right? The disciples were baptized by John in the water, but John said, oh, I baptize you in water, but the one who comes after me, he's mightier than I, I'm not worthy to bear his shoe latchet. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Then you read in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all gathered together in one place, in one accord. They heard the sound of mighty rushing wind and the Holy Spirit descended on them with tongues of fire. And so the Lord is wanting us to have both baptisms in order for us to be prepared for that new beginning. It's a washing where you're surrendering, you're saying, Lord, I choose. The spirit baptism is something he chooses. When Jesus was baptized, he had both at the same time. He had his water baptism, came out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended. You and I probably know people that have been baptized in the water, but it doesn't appear they've been baptized in the spirit. Now, baptized in the spirit doesn't mean you always speak in tongues, because in Acts chapter 4, the place was shaken where they were assembled, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God. They didn't speak in tongues there. So they especially spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 2 because they had visiting Jews from all over the Roman Empire on the day of Pentecost. They were able to preach in their native languages. But God wants all of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? There are different gifts of the Spirit, and tongues is one of those gifts. I believe in everything that's in the Bible, including the gift of tongues, the biblical form of the gift of tongues. But we need both baptisms. So this is very important. Unless you have this, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, Pastor Doug, what about the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized. How, how is he going to go to heaven? When Jesus was baptized, was he baptized to wash away his sin? The Bible says, who did no sin. Jesus was sinless. He never sinned. That's why he could pay for our sin. So if baptism is a symbol of having your sin washed away, why was Jesus baptized? Three reasons. Jesus was first of all baptized as an example for us. Christ said, I've given you an example that you should walk as I have walked. He was baptized to show us that something that's important that we should do. When Jesus first came to John the Baptist, John recognized he was the Messiah. He said, wait a second, you need to baptize me. You're sinless. And Jesus said, no, allow it to be so now to fulfill all righteousness. Second reason Jesus was baptized is Christ was baptized because it's uh, a symbol for those who cannot be baptized. There's some people who maybe they're in a hospital and they're on their deathbed and um, they're hooked up to machines. Maybe they're in a prison on death row and they are making the decision to accept Jesus. You think that God's going to say, you know, you couldn't get unplugged from all those hospital machines get baptized so you can't be saved. I prayed with people that were literally on their deathbed and invited them to accept the Lord. And I believe God heard their prayer. So I believe Jesus was baptized and he will give them credit for his baptism. And so he's given us an example. The other reason is the baptism of Jesus marked the launching of his ministry. You, you never hear about the miracles that Jesus performed or the teachings of Jesus other than when he was 12 years old and he was talking in the temple, but nothing specific is mentioned. It just says that he would amaze the teachers. But he really began his public ministry with his baptism. And in the same way, baptism for us ought to represent a new life of living for God, whatever your gifts are, using them for God, right? And so Jesus was baptized, and also we learned the other night, that marked the ending of that 400 or an 83 year prophecy in Daniel chapter 9. Number 9. What blessed ceremony can be compared to baptism? Answer. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27. It says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. It's like bride puts on her beautiful wedding dress, a symbol of purity and a new beginning. Husbands, the Bible tells us, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And so when a person's baptized, it's sort of like a marriage in a sense. 
See, it's a ceremony where you're showing, you're consecrating yourself to God. Now, how much does a person need to know before they're baptized? Well, you need to know the basics. Uh, you should be able to say that, you know, you understand, you've made a commitment to God, you understand the basic teachings of Jesus, and the Bible tells us that. But do you have to wait until you know everything? Uh, those of you here that are married, did you learn a few things after you got married? <laughs> About the person you got married to? <laughs> but when people don't know something before they get married, you know, the people that meet in Las Vegas and get married the same day, those marriages don't often work out very well, do they? And so you need to take time to know and understand the commitment. When people come to me and say, Pastor Doug, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. I'm interested in baptism. I say, great, let's prepare. That's very important. And make sure they study and they understand what's involved. Um, but when a person goes down in the water, it represents they're coming up, they're leaving behind the old life. They're now beginning a new life. Sometimes a person will come to me and they'll say, Pastor Doug, I want to get baptized, but... Um, I think if you'd only baptize me, I could quit my, my drinking and my smoking. And I said, no, it doesn't work that way. I said, you want to lay these things aside. When they came to John the Baptist, before they were baptized, he said, bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. Meaning, there ought to be evidence that you're prepared to turn from the old life before the ceremony. Ask the ladies a question here. If a man, assuming you're not married, if a man came to you and said, I love you and I want to get married, now you won't mind if uh, I'm still dating Jane and Sally a little bit. Uh, just, uh, but I'll quit soon, I promise. If you just marry me, I think I could quit dating them. Would anyone accept a proposal like that? So when people come to me and they say, you know, if you just baptize me, I think that I could stop. Baptism in the Bible, the, the water is still H2O. It's a commitment. The new birth happens in your heart before. The apostles were baptized by John the Baptist, but they were filled by the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, it was three and a half years later. And so I'm not saying you have to wait that long. I'm just saying that it may not happen necessarily the same time. I remember I went to the pastor when I accepted Jesus and I, I was still smoking. And I went to the pastor and said, Pastor, I, I just want to get baptized. He said, how's it coming with the cigarettes, Doug? I said, oh, the Lord knows I love them. He said, I don't question that, but baptism represents a new birth. And uh, what kind of witness is it for People, when you say, I just got baptized, and you blow smoke in their face, you know. <laughs> Jesus set me free. I mean, pass me another beer. No, that doesn't go, it doesn't go right. You know, you want to have evidence that you've been delivered from some of these, you know, obvious chains that people are s struck with. That doesn't mean you need to feel like you're perfect before you're baptized. But you don't want to be dating the devil either. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's like marriage. I'll probably go back to that illustration again. Number 10. What command did Jesus give to his people just before his ascension to heaven? Matthew 28, verse 19. He said, Go therefore and teach all nations, doing what? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now, whenever I do one of these prophecy seminars, we always include, always, this subject of baptism because it was a priority with our Lord. He said, I want you to go teach. Teach the truth. Teach the prophecies. But wherever you go, tell them, I not only want you to know, I want you to commit your lives to me. And so it doesn't do us any good to understand the subject of the beast and the mark of the beast and Armageddon and the second coming and all these subjects if we've not given our hearts to the Lord because the devil understands those subjects. But it's not going to save him. Baptism is as important to a Christian as a wedding is to a marriage. Baptism is very much like the wedding in a marriage. It is the ceremony where you make official, and you make public, your decision to accept Jesus and have your sins washed away. And uh, the symbolism is very important. I know that um, some people are afraid, quite honestly, of water. I, I did a I, I talked to a person about baptism before and they said, you know, Pastor, the reason I've waited for years is I am so afraid. Some people have hydrophobia and they're just afraid. And they said, I'm so afraid of somebody putting me under. And, you know, when a person's baptized by immersion, and this is the only biblical me method that you find, 
you briefly, you just lay them under, you bring them back up again, you don't hold them up. I've never lost anyone yet. I've baptized thousands of people. I did hear about one minister in Northern California that he was baptizing this man in a lake and his family had all gathered. He had been quite a scoundrel, I guess, and he had a dramatic conversion, gave his life to the Lord. And right when he walked out in the waist deep water there with the pastor, he told the pastor, he says, Pastor, he said, you know, when you put me under, he said, could you just hold me there a moment? Because I want to have a prayer. I've just been such a rotten person. I want to have a prayer while I'm underwater. The pastor wasn't sure how he felt about that. He'd never done that. He said, oh, don't worry about me. He said, I'm a good swimmer. I can hold my breath for an hour. Don't just put me under. He said, I'll pinch you when I want to come back up again. The pastor said, okay, you know, it's his marriage. You want to let him do what he wants. But he hadn't told the family. They were all watching. And so he said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he, he put him under the water, and he held him there. <laughs> Someone who watched this told me about it. And there's a family starting there. They're looking like they're getting ready to charge the pastor. <laughs> and pretty soon he, he benched him, he brought him back up again. But uh, we don't normally do that. So we don't want you to worry. You just you put him under and bring him right up. We even, well, I want to go. I, it is a sacred service, but, uh, you know, Baptism, like many things, um, it may not always look dignified, but it represents a new birth. A birth, I don't know how many births you've seen, but they're not all real dignified either. Uh, wedding is sometimes very interesting too. It's compared to a funeral. And uh, that's not always pretty. And baptism represents something very radical. It represents making a decision to get a new beginning with Jesus and being willing to demonstrate that publicly, and making that declaration. So because Christ makes it a priority, He said, go into all the world. These are the last words of Jesus. How important should that be? You know, years ago, when you would say goodbye to someone for a while, they didn't have mail, they did not have telephones, they did not have internet. You said goodbye to someone, you may never see him again, and you would pick your closing words very carefully. Now you say goodbye, I'll text you later. I mean, you know, people don't think like that anymore. But when you said farewell 2,000 years ago, you might not see them or talk to them. And those closing words were very precious. And Jesus, before he sends to heaven, he tells us, go, teach, baptize. That's a priority. Baptism begins the New Testament. It begins the book of Acts. It closes the New Testament. And so this is something that I think is integral to even the presentation of prophecy. Number 11. Where did all these counterfeit forms of baptism originate? And I, I need to be very careful. Um, there's a lot of dear Christians. I believe there's going to be a lot of people in heaven who maybe didn't understand what the biblical method of baptism is. Is that clear to everyone? I want to make sure you heard that, those watching. I believe there'll be a lot of people in heaven, maybe they were not baptized by immersion. The Bible says that the times of this ignorance God winks at, Acts chapter 17. The Lord is good and He knows sometimes we don't understand. When we do understand, He wants us to do what He commands. But sometimes we don't understand and God blesses according to the knowledge we have. But there's a lot of counterfeit methods. Mark 7 verse 8, For laying aside the commandments of God, you hold to the what? Tradition of man. It just came from man-made traditions. Let me just give you a little archaeological evidence. I'm going to show you a series of pictures here real quick. Here is a first century baptistry in Philippi. That goes back to the first century. They were baptizing by immersion in the early church. Here is a fifth century baptistry in Emmaus. That's a town in Jerusalem. Again, they would go in the water, they were immersed. They had these down by the Essene village by the Dead Sea. Any of you recognize that building? Tower of Pisa. Uh, I've been there a long time ago. Right across the courtyard is this church. The whole church is built around a baptistry where people were immersed. The church is a thousand years old. You go to Rome, middle of this church, again, a baptistry. People were immersed. You might be wondering, why do so many dear, sincere Christians now get baptized by a variety of other methods? Sprinkling being one of the most popular, pouring. Some do it with rose petals, some churches do it with salt, some do it by speaking words. It's called the dry cleaning method. They just I don't know, say a few words, they say, oh, well, you're spiritually being baptized. But historically, that was not the method. If you want to be a Bible Christian, I recommend you follow Jesus. 
It was not until the Council of Ravenna in 311 AD that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. So here it's over 1300 years after Jesus before these other methods began to come in. Now you might be thinking, well what difference does it make? Pastor Doug, it's just a symbol. I agree that it's water, but I do think the symbol matters. Jesus gave the church a couple of institutions. One is the Lord's Supper, communion, and one is baptism. Not that many. I heard about one youth pastor that said, well since communion is just a symbol of the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, it, you know, we can pray. We're going to take the kids out and we're going to get them Coca-Cola and hamburgers and we'll just bless it and it's the same thing. And so they said they're going to do hamburgers and Coke and call it the body of Christ and the blood of... Now isn't that sacrilegious? In my opinion that's sacrilegious. So whenever you start to get away from the beautiful symbolism that God put into these services, you're departing from the truth. He told us explicitly how to do it. And so when people say it doesn't matter. Slowly what happened, the change of baptism method did not happen overnight. It began probably with some of the, the wealthy and the aristocrats in Europe and when they were baptized they, they said, well, you know, it's not very dignified for us to get plunged, to have to, you know, take off our royal robes and, and since it's a symbol, perhaps you could just pour a little bit of that water on us and if you bless the water before you pour it on us it'll be holy water and a little bit will go a long way. And so you've heard about holy water? Where do you find that in the Bible? You pour holy water on people. I'm just saying, I'm going by the Bible. And then there were people who were sick and they thought you've got to be baptized before you die and they would dip a sheet in water and wrap them in a wet sheet and they'd say this is as close as we can get. And so it was in an effort to accommodate people they gradually began to change it and you know little by little the compromise begins to creep and pretty soon the symbolism was lost. Do you ever find an example in the Bible of babies being baptized? No. But were babies in the Bible dedicated? Yes. Was Jesus, how old was Jesus when he was baptized? 30. Tells us it was around his 30th birthday. The book of Luke chapter 3. How old was Jesus when he was dedicated? He was dedicated in the temple at eight, day, eight, eight days old. And so it is appropriate to dedicate babies, but the Bible says you need to repent and be taught before baptism. How can a baby do that? What are they repenting of? Number 12. What does the Bible say about those who put their, the teachings of men before the truth of God? Matthew 15, verse 9. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of what? Man-made commandments. Paul goes on to say in Galatians 1.8, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you other than which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul said, don't let him change it. It's, don't get away from the commandments of God and start following traditions. Number 13, But doesn't the baptism of the Holy Spirit replace baptism by immersion? No, not according to the Apostle Peter. You read in Acts chapter 2, after Peter preaches that Pentecostal sermon, in verse 38, the people said to Peter and the Apostles, what do we do? Now that we realize we've sinned and we've betrayed our Messiah, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and this is after the Holy Spirit is poured out, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said we need to repent and be baptized. Now, the apostles got baptized by water, then later they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Tongues of fire came. If you read in Acts chapter 10, it talks about a man named Cornelius and his family. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit, then they were baptized in water. They got the Holy Spirit baptism before they got the water baptism. But you need both. And Jesus, he was baptized by the Spirit and the water at the same time. Number 14. According to the Bible, what must a person do before he's baptized? Now here's a list of some of the criteria to prepare for baptism. It says that uh, answer A, understand Jesus' teachings. That's Matthew 28, 19. We need to know what we're being taught. Answer B, believe the teachings of Jesus. That's what Philip said to the Ethiopian treasure. He said, if you believe with all your heart. It's one thing to understand it. The devil understands, but he doesn't believe it. You've got to believe it with your heart. C, 
Repent of your sins. John the Baptist said, Repent and be baptized. Be willing to turn from your life of sin and walk in a newness of life. And um, let's go on here. Answer E. Agree to turn from that life of sin. Romans 6, verse 5 and 6. And that's also in uh, Luke 3, verse 7 and 8. Answer F. Accept Christ as your personal Savior and experience a new birth. And this is what Jesus told Nicodemus. Now, these are the criteria for baptism. Can a baby do all those things? No, that's why some of you who are baptized as babies, I'm not trying to offend you, you were dedicated by your parents as babies. And that's very important. And God's blessed that. I believe He blesses the parents that come and bring their children to the church and dedicate their children. But technically it's not the kind of baptism that Jesus practiced. Number 15. Is rebaptism ever proper? You find an example in Acts 19, verse 5, however, actually starting with verse uh, 2 through 5. Paul is traveling through the coast of Ephesus and he encounters 12 Ephesian believers. And it says, he asked them, were you baptized? And they said, we were baptized by John's baptism. And then said Paul, John verily baptized you with a baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him who was to come after him. And when they heard this, on Jesus Christ, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They had been baptized by immersion, the right method of baptism, but they would not heard about Jesus. So, there are three reasons a person might consider rebaptism. One is, if you are not baptized biblically, like Christ, by immersion, you technically have not followed biblical baptism yet. That's important. Second reason where it might be necessary to be rebaptized is if you come into a whole new understanding of the truth, you might consider being rebaptized. You know, I've been baptized twice. Quick story. You heard my testimony, some of you. I was up in the cave reading the Bible, gave my heart to the Lord. I had no preachers around me. One day, a couple of hikers came by my cave. They were some Calvary Baptists. And they stopped to visit with me. I told you my cave was right on the creek, so I'd frequently encounter hikers. And they said, are you a Christian? They were good witnesses. I said, well, matter of fact, one of the first times someone had asked me after I accepted Jesus, I, now I can say yes. They said, have you been baptized? No one had ever asked me that. I said, no. They gave me a really quick Bible study sharing some of these verses about baptism, but they didn't teach me about like living the Christian life. I was still smoking and doing lots of things wrong. And, and they said, oh, you got to get baptized. I said, oh, yeah, okay, okay. You know, I, they knew much more than I did. And so they took me off there into the water. Right outside my cave, there's a deep pool, waterfall, beautiful, picturesque spot. The water came from melted snow. So I, I did feel born again, I want to tell you right now, when I came out of that water. And they went hiking on up the trail. They didn't teach me anymore. You know, teaching also comes after baptism, too. And uh, I thought, wow, this is great. I don't know what to do now. I'm going to go celebrate my baptism. So I went to town, told my friends, hey, I got baptized. Let's go get some beer. And before the sun went down that day, I was in jail. It's true. Telling my friends in jail about, I just got baptized today. A few years later, I studied some of the things I'm sharing with you in the seminar. And the old pastor, wonderful saint, uh, he explained to me the baptism was a little more serious than that. It's a serious life commitment, like marriage. And you don't just rush into it. And, and, uh, and since that time, Praise God, I have never smoked, I have never drunk, and God just saved me from those things. And uh, uh, it's been a blessing walking with Jesus. Number 16. Is baptism connected biblically with joining a church? Acts 2.41 says, Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Yes, of course you need to be part of a church. Acts 2.47 praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. The Bible tells us in uh, Colossians 3.15 it says you are called into one body. Let me ask the ladies again. What would you think if a man came to you and said I love you. I want to marry you. But will it be absolutely necessary for us to live together? How would you do with that proposal? 
Wouldn't you assume that if you love me, you want to marry with me, be married, that we're going to like, you know, merge our lives now. And so baptism is you become part of the body of Christ and the Bible says that's the church. So a baptism's a baby. If a baby's born without a family, how long does a little lamb last out with the wolves? You need the protection of the family. And so of course it's part of that. Colossians 1.8, he is the head of the body, the church. If I were to say to you, look, a nose, and I point at the audience, you think, well, so what? Everyone has one, right? But if I point at the ground and say, look, a nose, you say, ooh, that's really weird. A nose on the ground. It belongs on a face. It doesn't belong on the ground by itself, does it? If any part of your body gets separated, you start to worry, don't you? doesn't last very long. We need to stay together. We're all members of the body of Christ. need to be in one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into how many? One body. Number 17. If I refuse baptism, according to the Bible, whose counsel am I refusing? Luke 7, verse 30. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, not being baptized of him. Speaking of John the Baptist. They spurned and mocked John the Baptist and they didn't repent of their sins against baptized and they were rejecting the counsel of God. Do you think that they were saved? Unless you're born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells us that it is very important. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Have you made that decision? It doesn't mean we do it today, but you might want to plan on that. If you've been thinking about being a Christian, embracing the everlasting life, preparing for the last day events, we would like to help you do that. We don't just do these seminars to uh, entertain people. We do it to try to get people ready for what's coming. If we're just doing it to entertain people, we're wasting our time. We're doing it because we want to get the message out there so people will know what's coming and be prepared. And part of that means being baptized. You know, the Lord wants you to experience what His Son experienced in baptism. It tells us in question 18, when Jesus was baptized, what did His Father say? Matthew 1 verse um, 9 and 11, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in, Borden, in Jordan. And it says, There came from heaven a voice saying, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And that's something God wants all of us to experience. You know, in connection with this meeting, both for those who are watching and those who are here, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. And we prepared a card we're going to ask our ushers to give you right now. And you can make a decision tonight. You give that to us, we will pray for you and with you. Those of you at home, you can actually download this at the Landmarks of Prophecy website. You can make a decision right now and say, you know, I don't want to just be a hearer of the Word. I want to be a doer of the Word. I want to hear the Father's voice say to me what He said to Jesus. I want the heavens to be open for me. I want to hear the Lord speak to me and say that uh, the Holy Spirit is coming into my life and walk in a newness of life. And you can make a decision tonight. And I'd like for all of us in our hearts to be praying right now because I think some people are going to make decisions tonight. People watching around the world, people here in Albuquerque, that could be the turning point of their lives. You can say, I want to be married to the Lord. I want to be washed from my sins, washed from that leprosy, get a new beginning. Take your card and fill it out. I'm going to invite Christian to come out. He's going to sing, I Surrender All. And uh, then we'll be praying together. When you've completed your cards, you can hand them down the aisle and give them to the ushers with the buckets. And those at home, you can email them back to us. We'll pray for you and help you prepare.
I trust you all have your cards now. Some may have already started filling them out. It asks four very simple questions. One, I want to surrender my life completely to Jesus. If that's your desire, check that box. Make the decision right now. Question two, I love Jesus and I'd like to be baptized soon. You'd like to start preparing for that very important decision. You can mark that spot. Third question, some of you maybe were baptized, but it maybe it wasn't biblically, or you may need rebaptism. Maybe you've learned so many new things. It says, I've been baptized, but I'd like to be rebaptized. You can mark that. We'll answer your questions. We'll try and have someone contact you. We'll provide information online for those of you who are watching around the world. You'll know where to turn. Question number four, maybe you're struggling with this decision. I'm praying about this decision, but I still have questions. Mark that down, and then um, you can turn your cards in, and we'll be praying for you. Friends, this is, you know, I felt like I've rushed through a very important subject. But I trust the Holy Spirit is compensating for whatever I couldn't say in your heart right now. This is something Jesus is calling on us to do, to get a new beginning, to have our sins washed away. He'd like to provide that for you. He's paid a lot to make it possible. I'd like to pray with you before we close that you can have that experience. And you who are watching, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, I know some right now are struggling with this eternal decision. Help them, Lord, make it right now and say, yes, Jesus. Though they may feel the struggle in their hearts, that they'll surrender to you. Say, I want to surrender my life. I want to be a follower of Christ and be ready for your return. And believe that with Christ's help, all things are possible. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends. God bless you. And when is our next meeting? Tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock right here. Also tomorrow evening, we're going to be talking about bowing to Babylon. And tomorrow night.